I'm Connor Rold and welcome back to another episode of Forgotten Oscar Films. And this week we're going to be looking at the 2009 film Precious. But if you're new to the series, what I do every single week is talk about a movie that was nominated for Best Picture and that I think has sort of been forgotten to time. Movies that are less culturally relevant, movies that maybe people don't talk about as much and trying to figure out why, that central question as to why it's been forgotten. Um, if you don't know the structure of the, the show, essentially starts off with giving a little bit of a history of the Oscars of that year, some context, which is always very important. Um, my thoughts on the film and my personal opinions, as well as trying to answer that central question as to why it's been forgotten. And in many ways, the reason why I sort of redid this series, if you don't know, I did season one of Forgotten Oscar Films, which started in the year 1988 and worked our way backwards all the way to 1957. Now I started in the year 2013 and we're gonna be working our way back to 1989, but I wanted to redo the series because you guys really enjoyed it, but also because I thought there's been a lot of changes most recently in the Oscars. And I think this, this episode and next week's episode will sort of be sister episodes in the sense that I'll try to explain the sort of main crux and change the Oscars in many ways, being this preferential ballot and the history that has really changed over this past decade and really how it created a sort of betting element to what's going to get nominated for Best Picture because it became so less uh, clear and, and really uh, became a reason as to why I started this channel because most of the times we sort of knew um, beforehand, but now every year winning Best Picture, it's sort of hard to tell. Um, you don't always get it right all the time. We do see upsets and oftentimes it has to do because of the measures made this year. So this was the first year where they expanded the Best Picture category from a five nominees to 10 nominees. But not only did they just expand it to 10 nominees, they also introduced this thing called the preferential ballot in which the users would have to actually rank their choices. So the nominations were changed because now there's actually 10 nominations, but also in terms of how we're uh, giving the winner to the actual person, you have to rank your choices. So before, if there was only five nominees, most of the time it was just whatever gets the most votes, therefore that wins. But now there's a more complex system where you actually have to rank your choices. So most times the winner, especially in sort of unclear years, goes to the movie that is the most well-liked and more controversial movies necessarily don't always win that best picture. Then in the coming years, I talked about it on the Extremely Loud episode that they slightly changed it where they only allowed essentially eight or nine movies to get nominated instead of the 10 that was here. However, they are going back to the system where there's going to be a guaranteed 10 Oscars for next year's for the 2022 Oscars, similar to this system. And what's so fascinating, we'll talk a little bit about it next week as well, is just the reasoning behind it. That's the sort of common theory and, and probably understanding is that a popular movie like The Dark Knight didn't get nominated in the 2008 Oscars. So for the 2009, they wanted to boost their ratings and essentially appeal to more of the popular movies. And I think it's almost indicative in many ways of what the Academy has been trying to do over this past decade. It really is sort of a, a microcosm of that because this rule essentially got them a bunch more ratings because movies like Avatar and Up that probably wouldn't have been nominated necessarily in, in other years did get nominated this year. And these were well-liked, very popular movies. Avatar was the most popular movie of the year and of all time um, for m many decades until, uh, for a decade until Avengers Endgame came around. And because they saw that boost in ratings, I think they sort of been chasing that. Now, you know, next year they're going back to the 10 nominees. They try to nominate superhero movies like Black Panther. Um, but What's so fascinating also about this year is that it also shows the flip side of the Oscars that even though they will nominate these movies uh, because they're you know the 10 movies allow for more popular movies to get nominated that doesn't mean that they're going to necessarily went give it to the winner and in this case the best picture winner went to the Hurt Locker which is the best picture winner that has the lowest box office of all time so the most uh, underseen terms of box office and theaters movie won over one of the biggest movies of the year in something like Avatar now of course there's different, you know, campaignings. And you have to remember at the time, the sort of relationship between Catherine Bigelow and her ex-husband, sort of James Cameron, and their sort of battle and the campaigning and all those other things that we have to keep into context. But I think it is sort of a, a great microcosm as to what the decade has really represented. The Academy chasing um, movies that are more popular because the popular tastes are diverging from the Academy tastes. However, in terms of the winners, the Academy still vote for their heart, still vote for who they think is going to win, which is why we see a lot of these smaller, more independent movies winning on um, last year with no 
Nomadland, you know, Moon Lake, Parasite, uh, these type of movies are, are, are more likely to win rather than the sort of traditional war movies. And The Hurt Locker, I think, is also sort of a representation of that. Um, but I mentioned that Avatar got nominated, uh, Inglorious Bastards was nominated, Up, District 9. We also had an Education and Up in the Air and The Blind Side and A Serious Man get nominated. Uh, this was also the year of Jeff Bridges and Sandra Bullock sort of finally getting their overdue Oscars in many ways for the Crazy Heart and the Blind Side. And then the supporting actor wins went to Christoph Waltz and sort of a surprise sort of who's this guy performance, but similarly with Monique for Precious, although they had very two different careers based on their supporting actor wins this year. So when picking which movie I was going to cover, I did my tried and true technique of which of these movies have I not seen. And once again, this was another year where I'd seen all of the movies except for one. In this case, it was Precious. So I figured that has to hold some sort of cultural weight as to why I watch something like, you know, an education over something like Precious. What is this sort of reputation? What is the actual contents of the movie? And, and try to figure out why it's been forgotten. However, I also think Precious is a great movie for trying to figure out what the Academy was at the time. That's actually in many ways a very representative movie because maybe one reason why I didn't check it out was because its reputation had been sort of campaigned into it being a historical footnote. It being a very much kind of Oscar baity kind of a movie that we don't see as a prevalent today or maybe gets sort of critically less appreciated today. Um, but most, for the most part, I knew Precious because I'm an Oscar fan and the Oscar history of Monique's win to Best Supporting Actress is a very fascinating one. And then how that sort of snowballed into the rest of her career or lack there of it. Um, she's probably most uh, known in the sense of the campaigning world for the fact that someone like her or even Frances McDormand don't really do the politics of the campaigning, of the politics that goes into it, of going to parties and stuff like that, that she sort of vehemently went against that so much so that when in her Oscar speech, she thanked the Academy for still rewarding it to her, despite the fact that she didn't do any of that stuff. However, what I think is fascinating is actually like it her to someone like Cuba Gooding Jr., who if you remember in 1996, won for Jerry Maguire and his supporting actor playing Rod Tillman. And that, what's interesting there is that he was sort of typecast in the same way that Rod Tillman is a sort of charismatic, interesting guy and funny guy in the movie, an exciting guy in the movie. And then Cuba Gooding Jr. in many ways was like that in, in real life. So it was almost like, oh, this is actually like Rod Tillman, but in real life, even when he went to accept his Oscar speech, he was jumping and laughing and he had such, he was so excited. And I think there's a little bit of a campaign factor that, oh, I like this guy so much. And then actually the real guy is similar to the guy in the movie and give him that kind of um, award for that. But because of that, I think in many ways, Cuba Gooding Jr. sort of got typecast and pigeonholed into roles and, and tried some couple of other Oscar baby roles, but never re-got another Oscar and sort of fell into great faces, uh, fates. And then in a couple of years after that, you know, he, he's starring in Snow Dogs and it seems like what happened to Cuba Gooding Jr. in many ways. And I think Monique uh, felt a similar kind of a path that in many ways, the campaigning thing, not campaigning rather, helped her because the character of, of Mary in in the movie that she played is kind of tough and mean and, and she doesn't listen to anybody. And, and I think in by not campaigning, the Academy actually really appreciated that because it was like, oh, she's really like this person. She really is kind of like um, tough and, and grizzled and, 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 and seen a lot of things. Um, so much so that you know she didn't campaign, but they still gave the award to her because of that lack of campaign kind of made her interesting and alluring and that she wasn't playing the game. And I think that was exciting. However, you know, when she was trying to do maybe other roles post the, the Oscar win, people wanted to see her. They wanted to see the character from Precious, which they thought was just her and sort of pigeonholed her in, into some of these roles, which I think she didn't want to do and then decided not to act. I mean, she's had made claims that she's been blackballed from the industry, which have been refuted by some of the other people, but she's maybe got that label, unfortunately, because she didn't campaign of not playing the game or being, um, tough to deal with and and maybe she is i mean there's not a lot of uh, credit to her name after this movie which is kind of fascinating uh, or maybe she's got that reputation unfairly uh, you know it's always difficult to tell but there is that kind of parallel with cuba gooding jr and i think what's also interesting though we always see like why was this movie forgotten which we'll answer a little bit later but the careers of the people seem to be indicative of precious being this sort of oscar baby movie and then any attempts to sort of follow up with that fail um, monique really has 
hasn't had a big Oscar role since. Um, Gabrielle Sidibe often does more comedic stuff, so she's gone the complete opposite way for this being her first movie. Lee Daniels, if you remember, had Lee Daniels the butler, which was sort of supposed to be a big Oscar player, and then failed to resonate with audience members, and even something like last year had the United States versus Billy Holiday, of which only got one nomination. So while he's well loved and he created Empire and he's well respected, his sort of Oscar movies have failed to gain the traction that Precious did. So his career has sort of not gone maybe the way people thought it would. And neither did uh, Gabrielle Sidibe, and neither did Monique. So we get this movie that these char the, these people are very much tied to the success of this movie and weren't able to sort of get over that stigma because in many times this was the first time people were seeing Monique. This was the first time they saw Gab Gabrielle Sidibe. Similarly with Lee Daniels, he'd only made one movie prior. So people sort of as associate them with the Precious movie and then because of that, um, don't necessarily, and because their careers haven't gone into auteur kind of landscape or interesting projects, uh, they often rely maybe back on seeing them just as the characters or as the director of this movie. And then I think also sort of tied a little bit with Blindside kind of shows the types of stories that were being made about black Americans and their sort of um, struggles um, that maybe aren't necessarily uh, politically as uh, relevant maybe today or maybe the movies that are being made about black Americans aren't necessarily about struggles because we have seen a lot of those movies but it was sort of notable at that time that both this and the blind side kind of um, tell this type of story which we we don't see as, as, as often today so maybe that could be another reason why it's been forgotten and but for the most part you know it doesn't have a super loyal fan base that I know of and is more sort of seen I think because of all the controversy and because of the sort of historical significance I think it's sort of being seen as sort of a historical Oscar baby kind of a movie and sort of stuck in that time as to one that's sort of willing to be rewatched and seen down the line. But transitioning into my thoughts on the movie, I had overall a good time watching the movie and I was really connected to the performance of Gabrielle Sidibe, who I thought really sort of carries the movie and I think the movie relies so much so on her shoulders that while Monique ultimately, yes, won the Oscar, she definitely has the more showy, uh, grander Oscar type performance in which she's very good at it. But I think that the movie succeeds, for me at least, because of it being a real sort of character study and getting into the mind of, of, of Precious. And I think both Gabrielle performance and how Lee Daniels, the director, is able to really communicate that to the audience visually um, is, is really terrific. Now, he, sometimes he does it in other ways that I don't like, uh, but what I really do appreciate, similar to something like a, a taxi driver in the sense that we are so much so in Precious's mind and the way she sees the world and the way she sees herself and sort of her plights and her, and her struggles um, are, are very easy to empathize with. And, and Lee Daniels does a great job to sort of understand and, and help us see the world through her eyes because of some of the directorial um, decisions and, and camera tricks and camera movements that he, he does. I'm thinking about this one great um, shot where Gabrielle's sort of entered into this alternative school and she's sitting on, on the these chairs and there's a very much a, a sort of like a wall for the hallway to turn that's sort of directly in the middle of of the screen and we have to sort of see Precious go over the sort of wall to get into the school sort of just climb that barrier and it's sort of like a static shot that very sort of you know it visually communicates it's not obvious in the sense but there is if you're if you're watching carefully that sort of clear divide that we see her sort of going over and, and sort of taking a new step which I thought was interesting uh, other things how she sees the um, pr pretty white girl in the in the fo in the mirror as the way she sort of sees herself when she gets ready in the morning you know just that small little thing that doesn't necessarily draw too much attention to itself, I don't think. Um, but it is, it's a footnote that doesn't necessarily add so much to the plot, but really adds to the character and understanding to empathize with, with her, her struggles, ultimately. Um, and then another one I, I loved was she sees sort of the vision of uh, her fantasy man on a red motorcycle, but then the, her mother walks in front of it, and the red sort of slightly tints to more of a, 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 a toned down maroon. So these are small visual techniques that I, I really appreciated that I thought that oftentimes you see and, and, and comment as these as sort of directorial, the first time director kind of um, flourishes that maybe Lee Daniels doesn't necessarily rely so much so on later on in his career, but I kind of appreciate the sort of earlier kind of more experimental in many ways uh, directorial tricks or flourishes because I think those things do a really great job at communicating to us visually without being super obvious how Precious sees the world and and how Gabrielle is really able to to portray that and, and communicate that through her face and, the, and her gestures and how she walks 
is really terrific. So that combination is what I really loved ultimately about the movie. Now, there's also times I think the narration, I think is a little bit too heavy handed. You know, sometimes she says, uh, Precious will do narration where she talks about how much she doesn't like her mother. And I'm kind of going like, well, yeah, I know she doesn't like her mother. <laughs> Did you see the sort of abuse that she, she deals with at home? We didn't really need that extra insight. Sometimes it's a little bit over the top in terms of over explaining things where I thought, just, you just need that visual communication and understand how much her mother is sort of a cloud over looming her life. Um, and then there's one particular reveal at the end, which I don't want to spoil, but because this is not really based on a true story, it seems like there's like one too many just terrible things that, that happened to the, the, this girl. And we're not really, especially the last one, we're not really able to sort of um, reflect on it. It's just something that feels a little bit more dramatic at the end of the story, just to add one extra thing. It seems a little bit um, over the top and, and unnecessary ultimately to the story. There's a story about this girl and that's what it's about, but all these extra sort of societal things you're trying to place on top of this feels more so of a character as written by a writer as composed to a, a real life person. And because it's not based on a true story, I felt like it was like one extra thing that was just thrown on top that wasn't necessarily necessary ultimately for the end goal of the story. But overall, I, I get the appeal and why I was so appreciated. I also get sort of how understand how these stories aren't the only stories being told. And, and you know, they were for a very long period of time, but now the different stories are being told and I think that's fine too. Uh, um, but I, I was de definitely, a, in awe in many ways of Lee Daniels and how he directed this movie and the, the choices he made in terms of visually communicating that combined with a Gabrielle Cedebay's performance. That she was really terrific in terms of understanding and being with this character and I wanted to spend time with her. Um, now, going over to maybe why this movie was forgotten, I think that in one point I said it's sort of the historical context that is tied so much to the movie that kind of weighs it down because there's so much conversation as to what happened with Monique's career and the supporting actress race and the Oscars and what this represents and what kinds of stories these are being told. It's so, in many ways a historical footnote that bears down on the actual movie itself. Um, that being said, it's also a tough movie to watch. I mean, there's a lot of bad things that happened to Precious's character. Um, that had all, all subsequently been, been parodied and whatnot, especially when the movie came out and was popular, that we've almost gone a step further, that it's, it's such a historical context that we can't actually relate to the movie. And because the movie itself is so difficult to watch in many ways and tough to watch because of how sad it is ultimately, it's not one that we necessarily go back to and rewatch. And then because of the careers of the people that are in it aren't necessarily you know, the, uh, have had such as much success as something like this movie, we have some, some, some toughness in terms of maybe going back and rewatching it. The same way, you know, last week I talked about the kids are all right. Well, maybe it's been forgotten in the sense of Annette Bening's career, but guess what? Annette Bening won't be forgotten. Mark Ruffalo won't be forgotten. You know, if you like Mark Ruffalo because of the Avengers movies, hey, you may check out this movie. So there's still some merit in the sense that that movie won't be as forgotten. But if you see someone like Gabriel Sidibe in the Brothers Grimm ZB, I'm not exactly sure if you're going to go, hey, I guess I got to check out all of her work because they have some, some different kind of choices and career paths that maybe haven't lived up to the success of, of a movie like this. But that's about it guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure you subscribe so you stay tuned to next week where I talk about the 2008 Oscars, why The Dark Knight wasn't nominated, and how ultimately that sent waves throughout the Oscars history. And like I talked about today, how that really has shaped um, the, the Academy's desire in many ways to try to appeal to the popular movie and, and use this as sort of a sister episode to, to next week's episode and see you know the, the controversies and how it really changed the Oscars in many ways, certain films and, and and thinking um, in many ways as well. But that's about it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure you comment below. Let me know your thoughts on Precious. Maybe you should have thought I go with a different movie, like maybe an education or something like that. I'd love to hear that stuff in the comments down below. But until next time, stay tuned.